Professor Kroita is the director of the joint program in survey methodology based in the University of Maryland. She is the founder of the International Program for Survey and Data Science at the University of Mannheim and is also affiliated to the Institute for Employment Research in Nuremberg. In addition to teaching courses on data analytics, paradata, responsive design, and big data, she is among the authors of many scientific articles and books. We will ask her today about online surveys and the use of big data in the context of the pandemic. Uh, so in the last two to three decades, the survey world has witnessed a proliferation of modes with the three basic modes of surveys dominating the field to a lesser extent. Would you say the COVID-19 pandemic has an impact on this increase, on this proliferation? Do we see new modes of new modes or new combinations of modes emerging? Absolutely. I um, can't speak for all the countries, but for those where I can see this a little bit more up close, which is uh, obviously Europe or in Europe, Germany and in the US, this has sparked a lot of innovation. Um, I'm Mostly that web or cell phone based uh, surveys are used even more depends on where the country started. So what we've seen in the developing world where face-to-face -face interviews were still pretty common, you know, if the World Bank went out and did surveys, for example, there's now a big push to do more telephone surveys. In countries where telephone surveys have been used for a while, um, in combination with face-to-face, -face, there was a, a push to um, bring people to web because it's harder and harder to reach them on the phone. But so everyone shifted a little bit, but it depending on where they started. Yeah, for sure. Okay, thank you. And maybe one uh, one additional thing I can uh, mention to that, uh, in terms of new emerging modes, I think that uh, what we see increasingly are uh, attempts, not, I haven't seen this fully in production yet, but uh, attempts to uh, um, augment uh, interviews with a video interviewer. So the way we are operating mm -hmm. right now, so invitations using, uh, Zoom or other products to do recordings and interviewing. Um, that has been used before quite a bit um, in the user experience research context, but not necessarily for large-scale surveys. And that I've seen now uh, surveys do as well. And then the other um, shift that we've seen, not a new mode, but a new way of doing things um, is that uh, faced with the need to get more information quicker that uh, several surveys seem to have moved to, or not surveys, data collection agencies have moved to creating panels of sorts where they can, you know, in frequent intervals, so, you know, pandemic related, for example, uh, if there's the need to every week or every two weeks check in with people, see how they're doing, you need a different way of contacting them. And so these access panel, as we call them, also have seen a greater um, uptake, I would say. So I have a question. Uh, so web surveys have become another option for cases where face-to-face -face is not possible. So from a total survey error perspective, which sources of error are the most underlined for web surveys, would you say, uh, so that researchers pay extra attention to? This is, this is a good one. I'm not sure if there's, it's possible to answer that across all countries and settings, right? So um, what we see, you know, a badly designed web survey, just like a badly designed interview survey can have a lot of measurement error problems, right? Where you, um, where people just get confused how to use the instrument, where you have huge break off because it's too long to begin with and people don't have the patience to sit through and, and those kind of things. So I do, I you know, the, the instrument design is just as important as it always was. Um, and whether this is a bigger source of error than um, any biases that come with having access to the web does depend on the country, right? And, um, and the internet penetration, I mean, when we say web surveys, I often tell uh, our students and folks that they really have to think of it as a survey done on a mobile device. You know, I mean, most people I would say, and I would go out on a limp and say that's probably true for all countries almost, um, do when they see these invitations not go to their computer, 
but um, but to you know just fill them out on the web and so having uh, sorry on their smartphones to the extent they have that and so having uh, a good interface that works on smartphones is key mm -hmm. and not every survey constructor pays attention to that. Thank you. So it's it, it sounds like um, you're saying coverage basically depends on which country we're talking about, but measurement is pretty much key in any case. It, it well, has I to be say, something. Yeah, so I mean, I would say that um, it has the potential to suffer from all of the problems, right? <laughs> Just like probably any mode, right? Exactly. And uh -huh. it, it really does depend on how in the design phase, how much attention is paid on these different uh, pieces. You know, there is, I, I don't think it's, it's per se inherent in a certain mode that there are uh, certain errors more prominent or not. It's just, um, you know, having an eye on them and having that mindset is important. I mean, you know, there are ways to, like, if you do a web survey, it's cheaper because you don't have an interview that you need to pay for, right? And so you could pour all that money into incentives, for example, which we don't do because we we like that they are cheaper, right? <laughs> but, um, and then uh, certainly that uh, would help with non-response. You know? So it's, it, it, it does depend on, on how you implement it, but I don't think we can speak of a certain, um, yeah, overarching suffering from any of the TSE elements. It, it really is a combined designed question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now we have a um, list of questions about the first Facebook survey you and your colleagues designed this year in collaboration with various institutions, including the joint program in, of in survey methodology at the University of Maryland, the World Health Organization, the Delphi Group at Carnegie Mellon University and Harvard, Stanford, Yale and John, John Hopkins Universities. Uh, so in a nutshell, um, this is a very large scale international survey which uses Facebook users as a sampling frame. It asks respondents about COVID-19 symptoms, testing, social contacts, feelings of depression and the like. Uh, speaking of which, I was actually sampled, so. I have seen it. Um, so can you tell us the innovations this survey brings? Uh, can we say social media is more than a source of big data, but has features to offer for traditional surveys? Yes. So, I mean, um, it was an incredible investment uh, from Facebook to work with the various research teams in the WHO to make this happen. Um, this is, uh, you know, they are behind the scenes, a lot of people at Facebook, in particular their data science team and the demography and social science group at Facebook, working to make sure just the, the, the mere flow of operation works, the sampling, the waiting, every day the weights are created and you, you know, it's, I mean, this is just, doing this on a global scale is, is a gigantic effort, right? And so, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say social media, but you know, you need like some some big uh, partner like this. Um, what is unique, I would say, is that because it is so at such a far-reaching platform, it has the big advantage, and and that certainly is an innovation that we we all in a sudden had a, a global sampling frame, which of course has flaws like any frame does and this one may be more flaws than other frames that we are used to or comfortable using um, in to the extent that they um, obviously can only sample people who are on Facebook you know I mean that, that that's by nature but what I think is interesting for us statisticians or survey methodologists to think through is that okay given this if our main um, research question or element of interest is the change over time and observing what happens over time in the country so that policymakers can adjust their um, decisions or, you know, physicians can sort of reshuffle resources. Um, then we would need, I mean, I think we, we, in this short time frame, we can be pretty certain that the the sampling frame, the population doesn't shift that quickly over time, right? And so 
you know, the point estimate, the level of which we get the data might be different, you know, where we over report certain things or under report certain things. But, but if the composition of the population doesn't change over time quickly, then the development over time can be nicely monitored with this. And, and I think that's, that's um, an innovation. And, you know, it, it reminded me of um, the, the Billion Price project that Roberto Rigonbon did at MIT, where he tried to get alternative uh, price indices um, from online postings of prices for Latin America initially, now it's done across the world, right? And there too, we know not all goods and services are online. Well, these days maybe they are, but not when he started this. And, um, but the development of prices online and offline trail each other nicely. And so this is a good indicator. And referring to Bob Groove's paper titled Three Eras of Survey Research, which was published nine years ago. Uh, he goes, for example, Facebook is not likely to make their database of members available to researchers for sampling or analysis, even at a fee. What do you think has changed in this last decade that has led us to where we are now? Yeah, I guess the world is changing, right? It, I mean, it might take a pandemic, but <laughs> hopefully not always that much. I think there are a couple of things. I mean, one is that um, Facebook had, even prior to the pandemic, always looked for ways to use some of the data for the social good or the public good, right? I mean, they, um, in, in my perception of the company, they truly believe their mission, you know, bringing people together, connecting people. And, and, and so this falls right into the mission, if you will. And they had, even prior to the um, pandemic, a group, Data Science, or D Data for Good or something like that. Um, and, and they were working with the World Bank and allowed the World Bank to field surveys on the platform to uh, investigate, for example, the participation of females in the labor force or as entrepreneurs. I think female entrepreneurs was the focus. So it's just that this one is sort of more visible. And, um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think there was increasing awareness at uh, Facebook that um, it is possible to contribute in a unique way, you know, and then sure enough, I mean, you know, with all the negative media they got, this is certainly a good way also to mitigate some of those um, concerns. I, I wouldn't, you know, take that off the table as one motivation that has changed between then and now. But I do think that, um, I mean, look what Google did too, a similar thing, right? They try to um, make the mobility data available in a similar way, right, in aggregated ways. Um, and, and uh, you know, always, of course, being concerned to not jeopardize the privacy of the people that are using it. But I do think that um, these companies, to the extent that they can, it doesn't hurt their business, are open to that idea. Um, I would say, to me, it's more likely they do this in the fashion they do now than they would do it for a fee that you can regularly pay this as a service, because then, then it becomes a product that you have to like be able to deliver, right? And and that could then, if it's not aligned with your core company interests, that maybe that doesn't work anymore at some point. But but I do think that these uh, social good aspects um, will maintain, and and uh, I I think I see that in a lot of companies an interest to, you know, if someone has a good pitch or a good idea on how that could work without harming the business or harming the people's privacy, then this great openness. And I think that will prevail. I don't think that is a solely pandemic context uh, behavior. I mean, what do I know? But that's my reading of the situation. So I want to continue. Actually, I, you already answered uh, some part of the question, but maybe you can give some more details. So can you give a comment on the coverage of the survey and necessity it is uh, representativeness? So in other words, what would you say about the omissions or multiple membership or the, the non-personal memberships or fake membership? So I'd like to hear more uh, about the, the coverage. Yeah, so, um, well, any fake members and trolls, I think would have a hard time answering a survey, right? That's way too much action that is not pre-programmed. So I'm not worried that we have those in, uh, the survey. Um, with respect to the coverage, I am. I hope that we get an increase in uptake of the use of the microdata globally, and uh, you know, or even just the API and aggregated data. 
that are available from people in various countries with a lot of country specific knowledge to answer that question, right? For the US, um, from all we've seen, um, both coverage and sort of predictive power of the data is fairly good. Um, in part, probably because there's just still a large portion of the U.S. population on Facebook, and um, and also the sampling happens at an even even more fine-grained level. You know, the people, you know, you know their zip code. I mean, in, in theory, we could adjust all the way down to the zip code level. For other countries, it's really hard for me to judge. You know, because I don't know. I mean. I can look into this more detailed um, for Germany, just glancing at it, it's easier for me to just to see it for other countries. One would need to look much more closely. And frankly, our team is too small for that. We haven't had a chance to look at this for all the countries, but I very much hope so that, you know, maybe your team or other um, folks take this up and use this because it really is, if you think about it, a phenomenal data set, you know, it's like has been going on for six months the same questions the translations were super you know we were really impressed with the translation teams at facebook and sort of the same questions are asked in all these countries you know week by week day by day i mean this is um really a terrific resource and um and so yeah i i, I do hope we can increase the user base and learn from those that apply it and learn you know look in their own countries for validation sources and you know where we, we need to fine tune. I mean, we do make adjustments to the questionnaire. This the round seven is coming up, and um, and obviously, as the world learns about COVID, other things need to be asked, other symptoms need to be asked, other covariates need to be asked, and and that kind of thing. So I would like to ask you about um, response rates and non-response in general about the survey. Um, we know that the data you collect is not cannot be linked to um, Facebook data to Facebook users, perhaps I should say, uh, and that Facebook provides you daily weights uh, to correct for age, gender, uh, and region. But are, is there any other non-response assessment on Facebook side um, for any potential bias? Yes, I, maybe you can link to this interview an archive X paper where the Facebook team has written about the weighting construction that they do. Um, so they, what they do is, you know, first of all, they do the sampling internally on the platform. And so they do know who was sampled and uh, who eventually participated in the survey, or at least those that then click on uh, being transported to the survey, if you will, right? And then from us, they get an ID back that says this person finished the survey or, I mean, answered it. Maybe they drop off in between, but people for whom we get the weight back, right? So this, this, um, identification is exchanged and um, and so then they can look internally using you know features variable I mean I call them features because they're not necessarily designed variables but whatever the data scientists would um, use from from the platform data to adjust for any non-response bias or like maybe we shouldn't use the word non-response since there are sort of clear definitions of that term but um, certainly to adjust for the non-participation error that we see here, right? So that, that uh, is happening inside. And as I said, the paper alluded to that a little bit in more detail. I'm, I do not know all the features that go in there and the variables and how they're coded. And that's by design, because if we were to know this, someone smarter than I, you know, maybe could eventually reconstruct from the weights the original information, right? I mean, I have a hard time seeing how that would work given the data that we have, but I, I wouldn't put it past the realm of possibility. So we just don't know, you know? We, I mean, if, if we were, it's only gender and only this, then you, you know, maybe could reconstruct what that must might be, and, and, but we don't know that, and that's a good thing, you know? Um, I know that the team works very hard to sort of use what they have uh, and, and what they normally also use on surveys that run on the Facebook platform. Um, and then on top of the non-response um, adjustment, there is a little bit of post certification weights going on from country data to mitigate a little bit the coverage error. Um, but that of course is a coverage error. I mean, this is the user demographics, right? So th there's not, it's not ma very many variables. Uh, for all the countries, and uh, who knows if those are the the variables that really drive um, being on the platform or not. So, I mean, from a 
So a statistician perspective, I would say the coverage adjustment is minimal, probably. Yeah. Um, and how about the levels of um, response rates? Yeah, so um, this, this varies a lot by country, obviously. Um, it reminds me that we should uh, publish that somewhere. You know, I mean, we've looked at it internally. We are monitoring it. Um, I mean, rates are low on these web surveys to begin with, right? That That's a given. And um, we, uh, you know, what we are concerned with is that um, obviously people start the survey, they might give up in between for all kinds of reasons. That's why the COVID symptom questions are at the beginning. They're mo the most important ones for this early warning. Um, we're discussing right now if we could shorten the questionnaire to sort of reduce drop-off uh, during the survey. Um, but the response rates have gone down a bit um, compared to the beginning of the survey. And this is not surprising. A, you know, in some countries, the we are already in sort of a resampling phase, you know, that people see the invitation to write. I mean, there's a cool down period for everybody, but then you might see the invitation again and uh, maybe next time around, it's not that exciting. And plus, I guess there have been so many surveys and so many attempts to get people's data that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see the usual fatigue uh, setting in. I have another question. Uh, we know that record linkage is one of your research areas. Could it have been possible to enrich the Facebook survey data through users' Facebook content with consent at the end of the survey? I mean, from a technological point of view, yes. From a privacy point of view, we wanted to absolutely avoid that. So there's, there's one thing that after all this Cambridge Analytica snafu, you know, scandal, whatever you want to call it. Um, it, it. Facebook had a policy that they don't allow chaining anymore. So we wouldn't have been allowed to do that survey and ask any, like, you know, initially we thought, oh, could we ask them to install one of those COVID apps that, uh, you know, Germany, for example, has this COVID app, you know, like, could we, could we invite them to install that or, you know, get consent to, you know, keep asking them yet another survey question or enroll them into a panel and whatnot. And this kind of chaining is not longer allowed, you know, it's against the policy. And, um, you know, I think the work I've done on record linkage, you know, might be relevant, a little bit, even more relevant is the work that I've done on consent, on this linkage consent, and maybe that's what you have in mind. I would have been way too concerned that people, you know, are sort of in a, in a habit of answering or, you know, that they, they might consent to something that they don't really think through, don't really understand and its implication. And um, and then at the end, don't feel like that uh, this is the appropriate flow of information as Helen Nissenbaum would say it, right? And so we, uh, I mean, it was never at any point a discussion that we would do this. Um, I think it is uh, too big of a privacy risk. And then on the Facebook side, the policies would probably have not allowed that to begin with. Is the research team considering a longitudinal dimension to the survey? This question came up a few times, um, only longitudinal and sort of a long, like cross-sectional, you know, same geographic area over time, not on an individual level um, for the same reason, right? That would have required that sort of IDs are kept and are mergeable and, you know, that, I mean, it, in order to have the data be usable, widespread across the world, and, you know, it, it is important that we, 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 we we really make sure that there's like no risk of the answers leaking anyway, right? And um, and so it would have been nice, but with this kind of design where the primary purpose really is to have, you know, like a thermometer, if you will, every day and see that longitudinal for geographic areas, um, everything else would have jeopardized that goal. I wouldn't rule it out that one could think of a design where that is possible, but not with this vehicle. Thank you. This marks the end of our questions on the Facebook survey. And I have uh, another question here uh, regarding Facebook. Uh, what do you think of designs that use Facebook ads for recruiting survey respondents or perhaps Google ads? Thank you for asking that. Uh, you probably don't know that, but we actually have started doing that. So um, in I'm working with two of my graduate students, um, Liana and Samantha, 
uh, on uh, and and the, another professor at JPSM, Stanley Presser, on on exactly that. Um, we are trying. You mentioned Bob Gross earlier. There's sort of a famous paper on the non-response side where um, different uh, topics are used to recruit people and then to see how the non-response buys or how the answer in the the distribution of the answers changes depending on the recruitment. We are, we implemented an experiment sort of similar in fashion. And we used on the survey questions that we have elsewhere um, in uh, the world <laughs> on a survey and, and can compare distributions to these other surveys. So results aren't in yet, so I can't speak to, to that. Um, I do think that it is just as promising of an alternative as many of the non-probability panels are. So the, the big difference to the advertisement selection is that, um, well, the difference between the Facebook COVID symptom survey that we talked about before and surveys where you recruit via advertisement is that um, the advert, the, 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 we have no control over the algorithm that displays the advertisement to certain people, right? I mean, you can target when you field advertisement on on uh, the Facebook newsfeed, you can say, well, I want to target a certain quota, you know, like people are this age group or what have you. But you, you have no control over who gets what which often and which combination, I mean, there's a lot of sort of algorithmic learning going on who gets displayed what, right? And and how friends of these people react to this, you know, if people may, I mean, it's, so I have no insights into that piece, right? And, and unlike the COVID symptom survey where it's sort of people go to the newsfeed and we know they saw it or they didn't, I mean, you know, it's, it's just, it's a very different setup. Um, but, it, I think it has its place. I think that, you know, if you're a researcher and you frequently use, um, let's say, Mechanical Turk or Survey Monkey or, you know, what have you, um, then recruiting your respondents over the Facebook platform via advertisement might actually give you a better population, right? Um, you reach a much more diverse group, I would think, than those that sign up to be one of those click workers or in some of these panels. That would be my hunch, right? You, you, you have a higher likelihood, I would think, to reach someone who sort of on occasion maybe would do a survey but would never sign up for any of these um, panels, right? But, you know, I'm saying this with, this is just speculation, gut feeling from a survey methodologist. On that part, I have not done any research yet, but I'm, I'm watching it with great interest. We have a colleague in Germany, Simon Kühne. Um, he has done a lot of work on the LGBT, LGBT community. And, um, and for him, it was great because he could recruit, you know, smaller populations that are harder to find in a, lot, in a, in a, in a big population um, much more easily this way, right? And in particular, if let's say, we've seen this in the COVID context too, that but let's say that you're interested in sort of a, a niche subgroup or, you know, just like small in, in comparison to the whole population. If your initial recruitment happens that way and then you set up a longitudinal data collection and again, your focus is on seeing what happens to those folks over time, then I think this can be very, a terrific source, you know. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I'm curious to see more research in that area, both on the content side, but also of survey methodologists evaluating the quality of the data. Uh, let's move to big data. Uh, we would like to ask you about source of error in big data. Actually, it's a hot topic in survey research for about a decade. Uh, can you tell us about how the big data total error perspective developed by Paul Beamer, which was discussed in the AAPOR task force report in more detail and you, your co-edited book, which was titled Big Data and Social Science, a Practical Guide to Methods and Tools. So it differs with the total, error, total survey error perspective. What are the common sources of error in the surveys and the big data analysis? And what are the additional sources of the error researchers be a way of when they're analyzing the, the big data? So I think for all the survey methodologists out there or people in the social sciences that are aware of the TSE framework, that's a big asset when dealing with big data because I think that we, our community is 
more sensitized to think about coverage, think about different error sources. How you call them doesn't matter that much, right? I mean, I don't think anyone from, of us is so like literal that we only look at certain areas and like need to classify them exactly, but it's more this mindset of knowing there are all these different error sources along the data generating process and it is important to keep that in mind. Um, I think one thing that we need to learn more about is all the errors that could happen sort of on the technical side in the big data pipeline, right? When th stuff gets put into a database, when features are generated. So there's even more, like, so the TSE framework always suffered a little bit from not having enough attention maybe on how the variables cre created and like what, what uh, Brady West and, and Joe Sachs, are there, I think they wrote a paper on like the analytic error, right? Like are the weights then afterwards used when the survey statistic is produced, that kind of thing. And, and so similarly, you know, there, the, in the big data stream, there's a lot of features that need to generate, be generated out of the data, right? And some of this happens algorithmically, some of this happens deterministically, but um, looking at that and all the decisions that I made on in that segment is something that I think um, is different between these. Um, but but the spirit that there are all these multiple sources and, and some have a more sort of social mechanism connotation and effect measurement and others have a more technical connotation and have affect the presence or absence of the data. Um, I think that's a big asset and, and helps us I think, uh, use these data more wisely than maybe people from other disciplines. Do we see any new exploitation of organic data to understand COVID-19 related matters? Like referring to Google mobility data, Google search trends for symptoms, wearables, COVID-19 related apps, mo mobile phone vendor data, etc. I guess yes, <laughs> all of the above, you know. <laughs> I, I've i seen attempts for, for all of those. Um, some I like better than others, you know, but I think it really, with any with any data and any measurement instrument, it sort of depends on, on what is the question that you wanna ask, right? And for certain aspects of the uh, problem that might be a good source and for others not, right? So like, like let's take, um, the variables example that you mentioned, right? It, it's sort of cool, you know, that you can learn uh, health, health, other health aspects of, um, let's say, a Fitbit data stream, um, given what the device can measure in addition. But um, you often rely on voluntary provision of the data and and people even being aware that you can donate your data in that way, right? And not being prompted or randomly sampled or what have you. And anytime that is the primary mechanism where, you know, you almost have to seek out a way and like, you know, you read it on the news and then you say so like, okay, yes, I donate my data. I mean, that leaves out a gigantic part of the population, right? And, and so and even figuring out how you then would do this, you know, I mean, th this is not going to be, you know, the, the risk, groups in the COVID-19 situation. If I think of my parents, you know, I mean, they would be utterly, I mean, they are overwhelmed installing the app to begin with, right? Let alone then uploading data or using it. So I think um, there in particular, it is important to have sort of the TSC framework in mind and, and give, given a certain use of the data, then evaluate the quality of these different data streams. Thank you. Um, so, um, the 2015 A4 task force reports, uh, which you were a part of, mentions the big data era as a paradigm shift, uh, with, for instance, face-to-face -face surveys at the verge of disappearing due to the pandemic. Uh, do you think the paradigm shift mentioned is picking up its pace? I'm inclined to say yes, just because everything feels like it's picking up in pace. Um, but then again, if you ask people, you know, 10, 20 years older than myself, they would say it has been always changing, right? I mean, 
I think it's often easier to sort of look post hoc and say, okay, well, this was sort of a demarcation line and then, the, you know, other things happened afterwards. But, um, but I, think, I, I feel like there's a constant evolvement, you know, and I, I, and I actually, I wouldn't necessarily say, like, yes, pace, maybe a changing pace in the sense that even more people talk about it and feel that way that this is sort of an important thing to consider or something that's going on but i think that um if anything i've seen also a step back again and realizing that you can't just rely on these other data sources that it is likely a combination of different data sources that's needed that surveys do still have their role and um and that we might be well advised to sort of more think of you know designed data products that have a you know a variety of different data sources go into it rather than banking on you know big data source x y or z yeah i have a question parallel to tuba's question and i already get some response i believe but let me uh, ask it so do you think the big data will eventually be an end to classical survey research if not, what would be the contribution of classical survey research be to data science? So, they, these are to me actually two very distinct questions, right? So I, I think, um, will it be the end? No, I think it is shifting its role. I think it's a good idea for anyone to maybe think of an alternative data source first before trying to collect everything with survey data. I do think that we had a time where there were just way too many surveys out there and unnecessarily so and, and one could use a lot, learn a lot about human behavior um, without necessarily having to ask. I do think that, um, you know, despite the disconnect between expressing attitudes and action, there can still be tremendous value in asking attitudes and digging it a bit deeper, right? I mean, so, um, in qualitative interviews also belong to sort of the classic canon of surveys and in particular when, when instruments are um, designed. And so here too, I could see a stronger connection between what's now called user experience research or, you know, more qualitative uh, in-depth interviews in really knowing how people use certain devices and then being better in understanding the data that these devices produce right like let's let's say i mean we did a lot of surveys on smartphones lately and um from the behavioral data that we pick up you know what apps are used and how these data are used it's clear that there is multiple device use going on we can't assume that everything we pick up from a mobile phone is done by one person right but in order to know that you will need um to ask folks that or learn that by you know observing how they use the phone and if you what was interesting to me when i spent some time in silicon valley in 2018 full disclosure working with facebook at that time on some other projects um and then talking to a lot of the other big tech companies well small tech but still tech you know it was interesting i thought i go in there and i say i'm building data science programs and that's why they want to talk to me no they wanted to talk to me because I'm a survey methodologist and they see that despite all the data they have, they frequently find themselves in a position where they need to collect some survey data because they don't necessarily know what the data they have means. And, and so for data scientists, I think, you know, if you listen to podcasts in that space, you know, for example, not so standard deviation from Roger Peng and Hilary Parker, Hillary often talked about, you know, her work at Stick Switch, uh, Stitch, Stitch Fix, <laughs> a, a company that sort of, um, uh, you know, suggests with machine learning algorithm what you could be wearing or want to purchase next in terms of clothing. That it was, you know, a true game changer there to really add sort of surveys um, to the data production pipeline. And, and so I think if anything, the disciplines will be moving closer together and I do think that um, we I mean that's the reason why I built this program that has you know survey and data science I do think uh, for many research questions or industry questions you just need both sources of information I have a question on the effect of pandemic on 
research topics. What kind of research topics when we think of social, economic, health-related, market, election polls, etc., do you think are most affected by the pandemic? What the kind of data will the world be struggling to collect the collect the most due to the pandemic? Of course, we always think of stuff that we currently think of, right? I mean, so who knows? I'm not like I'm. Um, I do think that census data collections could be affected um, in ways that might be hard to estimate. Uh, just because it does, so the verification that a person really exists often really happen through in-person interaction. And if that it continues to be not possible in the same way, I think that that would be a, a big change, right? And um, we'll see, you know, how, I mean, that does depend on how, how long it will take us to, to get a handle on the pandemic. Um, I think in some countries, um, we ha like the, the problem with the pandemic was that we had to shift modes without being able to do an experiment where then the old mode and the new mode can run in parallel and you can get an estimate of the measurement difference between the two and then continue onward with the next one. And so, you know, we will, we will see jumps in the data that we will not quite know, is this a pandemic effect, is this a mode shift? what's going on here. Uh, I think that's a, a bit unfortunate. Um, some data collections had to stop or pause. I know I hope that they will be able to uh, pick back up. Um, but, you know, it, it, there's always a flip side too. And I've seen in many countries an increased speed in making other data available, right? Or starting new data collection endeavors to capture exactly the dynamic of the pandemic. And, and so the work we've been doing in the US around the Coleridge Initiative, where we helped um, state and local agencies to unlock their administrative data, have them in a research environment where researchers can access it. Um, that speed with which that's happening would have not happened without the pandemic, right? And so is this bottom line then a net positive or net negative for data availability and, and social and economic research. I don't know. We'll see. I'm curious to know. So we we'll should talk again in five years. Thank you. And then we have the last question. So actually, this is a common question to, to, to ask during the all interviews. Actually, it's kind of hypothetical, but considering that the, the, the most effective vaccine kind of developed in Germany by two Turkish originated scientists. Yeah, I love that. Isn't that awesome? Like, I just love that fact. I mean, it's beautiful. So let, let's assume that the COVID-19 pandemic is eradicated overnight. So, so do you think surveys can go back to the pre-COVID-19 era instantly? Or what challenges do you think we should be expecting after the pandemic is over? Um, well, so one big challenge is, is at this point, very unclear for a lot of places what this means financially, right? How are resources going to be distributed and surveys, good surveys do cost money. And so, you know, that will continue to be a challenge, I think. Um, I think many things will not go back to pre-COVID just like that. I think that there has been innovations in um, the data collection that probably won't go away, right? I mean, just take, like, people probably fast forwarded their decentralization, uh, decentralization of um, telephone interviewing, right? Instead of everyone having, having everyone in a telephone studio, you know, you have people call from their houses and use a joint uh, platform to uh, distribute cases and what have you, right? Those kind of things. Why would you need to go back to the old model, right? Um, if I mean, there's software out there that uh, can be used to still monitor the interviewers and all of that. So, so I think I, I can't see reason why those kind of innovations would be dialed back again. Um, I do think that uh, I, I do, yeah. So I, 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 I'm, I don't know. It's just my nature. I'm, I'm sort of uh, hoping that a lot of the innovation will prevail. I have a harder time thinking of sort of additional challenges that will happen post uh, COVID, um, except for 
maybe everyone on these teams being utterly exhausted because this year was just draining and uh, probably true for you guys too. Um, you know, everyone trying their best to make as much data available as possible and adjust and whatnot. So I, I, I could see us all falling into a big dip <laughs> and just like, whoa. so that I'm a little, I'm more worried about the people actually that invested here than about sort of structural things that we can't figure out. So, you know, I, I, I said the other day to my husband, I, you know, maybe we should just all like take the rest of the year off because <laughs> it feels like we, we're ready to take a break. Yeah. Anyway, obviously we can't do that, but I'm, I'm just saying, I think that that's sort of more the side effect that I would see right now. So that's a great idea to having the rest of the <laughs> <laughs> So I should also consider this too. And I personally, I also really believe that so even the, the pandemic itself, of course, not a positive thing, but it certainly has a positive effect on the survey research methodology. So kind of, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, how can I say, so, so some potential motivation or a, a kind of a, mm -hmm. a impact, a big impact on the, on the different ways of data collection and survey methodology. And connecting people. I mean, you know, the interview we do now, all the conferences they were, that were now more easily accessible for people who would not be able to travel the, to the US and, and things like that. I do appreciate that a lot. Our seminar series at JPSM is open to everybody and we see that, you know, there are now like 80, 90 people listening instead of 10, you know. So, I mean, no, I'm exactly, it usually was more than 10, but you get the idea, right? And so I think that knowledge distribution is increasing too. And of course, we all miss sort of the in-person um, interaction and the possibility to sort of exchange an idea more casually in the hallway and then run with it. But but again, these are all trade-offs. And, and so it'll, it'll be good if you preserve some of that interconnectedness that we all now have based on this shared, albeit negative, but still shared experience. Thank you. Uh, we actually reached the end of our questions. So I want to ask my colleagues if they have any other questions to Professor Kreuter. So I'm done with the questions. Uh, great. Well, thank you for this interview. These were great questions. I really had uh, fun talking to you guys. So thank you for having yes, me. This, thank you very much. This was great for us. We've asked you a lot of questions that are outside our experience and expertise. So it has been um, quite educational too for us. So thank you for all your, for, for all your input and all the time you spent for us here.